chapter 39, getting close to the end. And uh, those of you who have um, subscribed to my channel, I appreciate it. So I hope you like the story. And if you feel like leaving a comment, please do. Um, I completed my warm-up pitches and Stanley whipped the ball down to second. The infielders tossed it around with Tony Fernandez flipping the game ball back to me. Good luck, kid, said Tony. Keep it in the park. We'll snag it, he added. The Yankee infield was filled out by Randy Velarde at short, Pat Kelly at second, John Tavi at first. The outfield was Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams in center, Ruben Sierra in right. Sierra would normally be the designated hitter, but Red was kind enough to let me hit for myself today. He really put himself on the line with that decision. I looked in for the sign and Stanley asked for a fastball. I moved slightly to the outside against Ricky Henderson of the A's. I held the glove against the left side of my ribs, moved it out slowly and slid my hand in to grip the ball. I rocked back a step while my hands and glove went back over my head, turned my foot sideways against the pitching rubber, forced my upper body toward the plate, and with a strong push of my muscular right thigh, whipped my right arm toward home plate. The ball sped toward home plate at 96 miles per hour, cutting the outside black knee high. Strike one, yelled the umpire Steve Palermo. The crowd cheered. It seemed to be deafening to me. 50,000 fans were a little different than the three to 5,000 that we saw at the Monarchs Club. No mind, I took the throw back from Stanley and towed the rubber again. Ricky Henderson looked down at Stanley. He doesn't plan on doing that all afternoon, does he? asked Ricky with a smile on his face. If he does, it looks like I won't be hitting a first inning dinger, does it? Hope not, answered Mike, returning the smile. That is the plan, you know. Figured as much, replied Henderson, digging back into home plate. My next pitch was the same, only this time on the inside black. Ricky swung over the top, trying to catch up to my fastball, but he couldn't do it. Strike two, yelled Perlar Palarmo. The crowd was delirious and rose to their feet, chanting, Billy, Billy. I again took the return throw from Stanley and walked back to the top of the mound. I got the sign from Mike he wanted a slider and moved slightly to the outside again. I rocked and fired, starting the pitch knee-high on the outside half of the plate. By the time Henderson began his swing, the pitch started a foot outside with Stanley backhand backhanding it six inches off the ground. Ricky could have only touched it with a 70-inch bat. Strike three, shot at Palermo. The crowd was shouting the house down. Stanley whipped the ball down to Fernandez, who started it around the horn. Henderson was leaning against the nub of his bat, regaining his balance after lunging for my last pitch. He slowly back to the, walked back to the A's dugout, tapping the barrel end of his bat, mumbling to himself. He looked out at me and kind of tipped his cap. The next two batters grounded out to Velarde a short and Kelly a second. I was hoping not to have to face Mark McGuire in the first inning with people on. Dad would come in the second with nobody on, and that's the best way to face him with the year he was having. The crowd was chanting again as the Yankees ran in from the field. It changed to mostly applause as I crossed the first baseline and moved toward the dugout. Jack Myers was the first to greet me. Great job, Billy, said Jack with a big grin on his face. Thanks, Jack, I said, sitting down to put my jacket on my arm and reaching for a towel to wipe down my forehead. To open the Yankee first, Fernandez walk, and Kelly hit a soft single to left. Velarde tried to advance both runners, but with a bunt down the third baseline was so perfect, no one could make a play. Ron Darling, the ace pitcher, was clearly in a jam. John Tavy strolled to the plate next, with the crowd going nuts, with the bases loaded. This was an even matchup. Darling knew nothing about Tavi, and John knew nothing about Darling. This was going to be good, old-fashioned hardball. Tony La Russa, the A's manager, sent Dave Duncan, the pitching coach, out to the mound for a talk. 
It lasted less than 30 seconds. Tavi got into the left side batter's box and began smoothing out the dirt. It was mostly a nervous habit since Fernandez, Sierra, and I were the only other left-handed hitters and we didn't dig in that much. Darling was ready and got the sign from his catcher, Steinbach. He rocked and fired a waist-high fastball toward the plate. Tabby cocked his bat, opened his hips, and threw a powerful level swing. He touched his bat briefly and was launched high into the right field air. Darling turned, bent over at the waist, putting his hands on his knees, and looked into the ground. He knew he made a mistake. The crowd became silent with anticipation and erupted as the ball landed into the upper deck. Tavi rounded the bases emotionless, not trying to hot dog it at all. He crossed home plate with hardly any emotion showing on his face. He was greeted with high fives from his batted in teammates. The Yankees four, A's nothing. This truly was a storybook beginning. Tavi came down the steps and was first greeted by Red. Man, am I a great manager or what, said Red, beaming ear to ear, while slapping Tavi on the shoulder. Guess so, Skip, said John with a big grin on his face. Smart enough to bring the three of us with you, they both started laughing. It wasn't always going to be like this, so you had to enjoy these moments when they came. The score remained the same through five innings. I only gave up two scratch singles in the third and the fourth innings. One was to Ricky Henderson on his second at bat, who stole second but was left stranded. My pitch count was at 78, so Red told me, only one more inning. So he sent Jack Myergers out to get warmed up. I got through the sixth inning except for Mark McGuire. I put a perfect fastball on the outside black, knee high, that Mark McGuire flicked, into the fifth row of the short right field stands. Stanley walked out to the mound with a new ball. Bill, don't worry about it, said Mike. That was a good pitch. And hitters like McGuire, well, sometimes a good pitch is still not good enough. But you have to remember, the right field porch here at the stadium is very short. Forget about it and let's get this last guy and get out of here. You've pitched one heck of a game, so stay focused. I nodded and retook my place at the rubber, twirling the ball inside my glove. I sent a wicked dropping curveball over the plate that was weakly tapped to short. Velarde threw the runner out by six steps, and I had done my job for today. The crowd roared with approval and admiration. My performance was more than anything I had right to expect. The only problem was they didn't know that this was going to be the norm and how I was to be and how hard I worked to make it look so easy. The Yankees were about to be turned around. The town and the fans just needed to be ready. The rest of the year was going to be exciting. Jack Myers breezed through the 7th and 8th with an assortment of all-speed breaking pitches that were in sharp contrast to what I had shown them for six innings. Jack has a 90-mile-an-hour fastball, too, but he kept throwing what was working. The Yankees' closer came in and mopped up the ninth with his wicked split-finger pitch. Three strikeouts to close out the game had the Yankees' fans beside themselves with excitement. Maybe what the boss had done was just what the team needed. One game was not a turnaround, but it would be hard for the press to be critical of anything that happened today. After the game, the first thing Red did was to call Gus and tell him the news. He had just had to talk to his closest friend. Hey, Gus, did you have a chance to watch the game, asked Red. About ten of the players came down to the park, and we watched the game here, said Gus. Billy was something to watch, wasn't he, added Gus. He was just vintage Billy, replied Red. And Tavi, man, did he set the table of the game. Think I'm most happy for him, if that's possible. The last couple of years have not been pleasant for him. I hope this is a big turning point in his life for him and Chris. Me too, said Gus. And Jack did great too, added Gus. That would be something. If both we and you win pennants, that would be unbelievable. Who knows, said Red. 
Just take one game at a time, and I hope to have your replacement players show up. Are they there yet? Yes, they have, said Gus. The boss was true to his word. He also threw in this young, black string bean of a pitcher from California. He looked like a strong wind could blow him into Rhode Island. But he throws 90-plus, and the kid's got the longest fingers I ever saw, and he throws a wicked fork ball. We should be all right with him, and Den is a good guy. I feel sorry for him. What was going on in New York was not all his fault. He's taken it like a man, though, and the players all like him. That's great, said Red. Listen, I've got to go. Another press conference takes place. This is going to take some getting used to. In the Monarchs, the paper could have cared less about us. Here, they seem to be crawling around on every one of your pockets. Take care, Gus, and keep in touch. Good luck, Red, said Gus. I'll talk to you soon. Both men hung up. They both had their jobs to do. Gus had a night game to get ready for and some new lockers to repair. Red had to become Mr. Diplomacy for the Yankees. Only today was going to be easy.